before we go into the discussion, um, I'm very excited to share that we have um, four words that have been recorded um, to kind of ground this conversation today. Uh, so the first one um, is a recording uh, with Rebecca Solnit, who's a writer, a historian and an activist. She's the author of many books on feminism, Western and indigenous history, popular power, social change, and change and insurrection. Um, so in a second, we're gonna be playing uh, the video of her kind of recorded words of wisdom for all of us here. Uh, just a quick flag, um, and I guess apology in advance to anyone who's following on the uh, interp interpretation channels. Vid recorded videos are quite difficult to translate live. Um, we have amazing interpreters who are doing a stellar job, um, but just a, a flag that it might be a bit difficult uh, just for those videos. So please uh, bear with us on this. Um, okay, Chris, do you want to play the forwards by uh, Rebecca? Thank you. If you're a climate activist, you're my hero. If you're a climate activist, you're changing the world. But it might be hard to see how much you've changed it already and daunting to contemplate how much more there is to do. If you've been a climate activist for a while, you may feel bruised or disillusioned by years of encounters with the amoral indifference of banks, politicians, fossil fuel executives, or the people around you who are checked out. Please seek and cherish their opposite, the visionaries and idealists, the truly committed, who are springs from which we can all drink. And perhaps you yourself can be the spring that quenches someone else's thirst. And remember that we have achieved so much, changed so much in the past 10 and 15 years, including the collective imagination which then was uninformed and unengaged and is now so different. You did this, the climate movement did this. You got the public across the world awakened to the largest and most complex problem we've ever faced. That was the biggest task of all. Climate chaos itself has also woken people up. The heat, the fire, the floods, the crop failures, the strange weather. But those dots needed a narrative connection and an answer as to what to do, we have it. At the Not Too Late Project, Thelma Young, Lutuna Tabua, and I co-founded, we like to say we respect despair as an emotion, but not an analysis. You already know the scientists and energy systems engineers and climate strategists give us some margins of possibility in their appraisals of the situation. They tell us it is urgent, but not too late to choose the best path and steer away from the worst. Everything depends on us doing so. But still there is this grief, this fear, this sense of loss, this fury and frustration. I get it, I feel them too. But lately, some of the wisest among us have begun to speak more directly to these feelings. Adrian Marie Brown makes the crucial point that we feel these things because we love. We love justice, we love the earth as the oceans and the cycle of seasons and the migrating birds or one particular place we know as a friend or refuge. We love the young who deserve a future. We love the future as the grounds for our own hope. Recognizing the underlying love is recognizing your own moral core and its strength. I think we sometimes believe these feelings will break us. One of the dismal things about the positivity culture around us is that it tells us to believe that these are signs of illness or failure or grounds for shame, that we're supposed to be happy all the time, like we were supposed to live someplace where it was never night and, and always sunny. There is no such place on earth and no such place in the human psyche. There is sorrow that will not break you, but there is denial that will flatten you out and make you a stranger to your own inner world 
and those of others. The insistence on endless cheer and false happiness is ultimately an insistence on shallowness. These other emotions open up your own depths to you and love takes root in the depths, the way that plants grow in the night. Mariam Kaba tells us that hope is a discipline. Not hope is optimism, which assumes that everything will be fine and nothing is required of us. That's only the flip side of pessimism and despair, which likewise require nothing of us and buffer us from uncertainty, which somehow we dread and try to avoid by the most extravagant and ridiculous means. But uncertainty is unavoidable if we're honest. The future is also a night in which we cannot see far. We can only navigate it by looking to the past where we can count our victories and measure change and see how power grows and imagination shifts. There will be losses. There are losses behind us and ahead of us, but there are nevertheless things worth fighting for and will be every step of the way. The South Pacific climate activist Julian Aguilon writes, part of our work as people who dare to believe we can save the world is to prepare our wills to withstand some losing so that we may lose and still set out again anyhow. Hope for me is the recognition that the future will be in part what we make it in the present. With climate, this is very clear. Here we are in the decade of decision and the race to reduce emissions and transform not only literal power systems, but beliefs and values. We know the future is being decided by our actions in this dangerous, turbulent present. When I'm hiking or traveling or just trying to meet a friend, I have a bad habit of losing faith just before I get there, losing faith that I'm on the right path and will arrive at my destination. Sometimes I ask for directions or check my phone or map only to look up and see that the person or place I sought is already within view. With larger issues, we can give up, but I also sometimes look up and see that this new world of changed beliefs, changed histories, changed possibilities, changed relationships is well underway and we all have one foot in it. We are not starting, we are enlarging what has already begun. I believe we can arrive at our destination if we keep on going. It will not be perfect, it will not be everything, it will not be without loss. It will be necessary to learn to see in the dark Chris, we've lost the sound. Sorry about that, I'll restart it. It's work. No, Can you hear it now? Because a lot of our work looks like nothing. The pipeline's not built, the money not invested, the forest's not. It's gone again. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Yeah, it did seem to cut out as soon as... Okay, that's good now. I want to leave you with a reminder that we already live in the impossible world. Only a few decades ago, a world powered by renewables was impossible. These were weak, ineffective technologies then, but we are at the inception of an energy revolution far greater than the industrial revolution and its steam power. Go back much further and women having the vote or slavery ending were wild far-fetched things whose advocates were told they were naive dreamers of impossible things. I myself was born into a world in which gender inequality was universally the law and the custom, and which to be queer was to be treated as criminal or mentally ill, or both, in which the civil rights movement was gathering power, but its achievements were all ahead of it. I am the same age as the Berlin Wall that seemed like it would stand forever before it came down in 1989, and the Soviet bloc began to crumble, and the Cold War fade out. 
I am a year older than Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, almost a decade older than the USA's Clean Air Act and the Environmental Protection Agency. The world I was born into no longer exists, and the world in which we are now talking would have been unbelievable, even incomprehensible to people in 1961. The world you younger people will live in 60 years from now is likewise unimaginable, but unimaginable is not impossible. Looking back, we can see how stubborn idealism built the best parts of the world we are in now. Last week, I had a drink with Marianne Hitt from West Virginia, who co-led the Beyond Coal campaign for a dozen years. She wrote when she wound up her time on that campaign that shut down 358 existing coal plants and prevented 200 more from being built. Coal provided half of our nation's electricity when I came to the Sierra Club a decade ago, and we were told it was always going to be that way. Well, we're now getting less than 20% of our power from coal, and this year the U.S. will get more electricity from renewable energy than from coal for the first time ever. As we sat on San Francisco's waterfront, long V's of brown pelicans kept flying by, and I thought of Rachel Carson because her 1962 book and testimony is why we banned DDT and why those powerful birds came back from the brink of extinction. Those pelicans say, maybe, they say possibly, they say, don't stop. Thank you, don't stop. Thanks, Chris, and thank you, Rebecca, even though she isn't here with us today. Uh, these are really powerful words um, to, uh, I guess, center the conversation we're going to be having today. Um, we're now going to play another uh, recorded uh, contribution from Reverend Retta Morgan, uh, who was an international professional singer for many years before completing studies at One Spirit Interfaith Seminary in New York. Um, and to become an ordained, ordained interfaith minister in 2009. She's the founder of Ecclesia Spiritual Center, an interfaith spiritual community that meets monthly in Philadelphia. Uh, and some of her most meaningful work is, in me is, sorry, is mentoring and counseling activist leaders, encouraging self-care, and what she calls a spiritual toolbox to aid against despair, overwhelm, and depression. Um, so I'm going to leave it to Retta now. Greetings and peace to each of you. I am Retta Morgan, interfaith minister and singing healer. This is an invocation and blessing for the work you are about to do together. So I invite you to take a deep breath and settle into the place where you are and listen as best you can with centeredness and groundedness. Love with all your 
might and see. Hold my hand in the eye of the storm. I will hold your hand in the eye of the storm. Hold my heart, hold my heart, hold my heart in the eye of the storm. I will hold your heart close to mine in the eye of the storm. Breathe and be And see, oh, yeah, yeah, hold, hold on tight in the eye of the storm. Oh, yeah, love, with all your might in the eye of the storm. Yeah. Breathe and be in the eye of the storm hey, here is where you can enter in the A big, big, big thank you to Retta. Um, and I hope this uh, grounded you in, in this space uh, and in the discussion that we're about to head into. Um, so yeah, I guess I just wanted to uh, 
get started with uh, maybe giving the floor to Hope and then to G. Um, I'll let you introduce yourselves and, and maybe uh, introduce the work that you do and, and how it's um, just how relevant it is to, to this question of how do we sustain activism in the long run? How can we be more emotionally resilient in our activism? Um, so I'll let you uh, say hi and, and then we'll get a bit more into the discussion. Uh, Hope, do you want to get us started? Uh, thanks very much. After these powerful introductions, it's difficult to know where to start from, but I'll try. Uh, I'm Hope Chigudu and uh, I'm an activist. I'm a feminist and I do recognize the importance of diversity and inclusiveness in the work that I do. I come from a tribe that believes in the power of the collective. We had to do any work that just the collective is the way we ensure resilience. So whether women are fetching water, they'll do so with joy <laughs> and they'll be singing. Whether they are working together in their gardens, they'll be sharing hilarious stories and they'll be, you know, really happy. So work is really not separated from uh, self-preservation, from resilience. Resilience, not in the sense of, of bearing, you know, ensuring that you survive. It's resilience in the same of collective energy. It's resilience in the form of collective well-being. It's resilience in the form of understanding that you're a vehicle. And if you're a vehicle, you need to be sustainable. You need to ensure that you know that you 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 check in for um, to diagnose if there are problems. You check in to ensure that you're okay. So I come from that culture that ensures that how. Oh. You don't resist a lot of things that we carry, the bags that, we... yes? Sorry, we lost you, you for a bit. Me? Or maybe it was just me, but I think, yeah, we lost you for a little bit. The audio is a little bit choppy, um, but you seem to be back now. So let's, let's. But can you hear me now? Carry on. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying that, you know, um, resistance is collective because some of the pains that we carry, we are not packed by us. They were packed by others. If you think about the pain of homophobia, and you think about the pain about the pain of patriarchy, it was not packed by us. It was packed by many other people out there. So solving that pain cannot be individual. It has to be collective. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, resilience is not about withstanding pain on your own. It's about understanding it and getting others to support you, to work with you, to understand what is happening. It's about grounding, being grounded as a collective, being grounded in a way that enables you and you know do things together with them from resilience self 
you know, initiatives. It's, and because of that, when we talk about resilience, we are not talking about suffering quietly. We are not talking about um, bearing it all. We are talking about collective well-being that enables us to be um, to be stronger because we are many. That enables us to understand the origin of whatever is breaking us, fragmenting us. So when we try to come together, bringing back the self, you know, from all the different fragments that have happened because of what we experience, we do it together, you know, as a group. We do it together in what we have come to call uh, movement building. So we find that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, there are things that are very difficult because we deal with very difficult emotions. We deal with very difficult physical pains. We deal with very difficult intellectual disconnection. We deal with, you know, colonization. We deal with racism, homophobia, and many other things. But these things, we inherited them. And because we inherited them, we can't deal with them as one person. We have to deal with them as a movement. We have to create movements that can carry the heavy load that one person cannot carry and see if there are some questions. Thank you, Hope. Uh, we did lose you a, f a few times uh, in that, but um, it seems to be working now with that, the video. Um, thank you so much uh, for these, uh, I guess, introducing uh, words. Uh, G, do you want to go as well? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, lovely to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, it's great to be in a space where uh, people involved in um, you know activism are giving so much attention to these kinds of issues. You know, questions about about resilience, about sustaining ourselves. My my interest in this kind of work goes back to uh, two thousand and nine. Uh, some of you were probably around then as well, right? Uh, involved in climate activism. You'll remember 2009 was the COP15 in Copenhagen. And it was a, following that event in December, it was, there was a big kind of crash, I think, for the climate movement. You know, there had been a bit as there are today, the kind of narratives around, you know, this is our last opportunity, you know, last ditch sort of chance to, to, to make a difference. And of course, that meeting, the the COP fifteen meeting, ended with you know, no no real no 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 important significant kind of movement forwards, uh, and a lot of activists on the ground, a lot of organisers on the ground, got really battered, you know, by the, the 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 police in Denmark as well, and so you know we saw an enormous kind of hemorrhaging of talent at that time, we saw uh, a lot of groups and organisations sort of dissolving. Uh, a real increase in the kind of uh, in, in internal kind of conflicts within groups. Uh, so many people, friends, colleagues of mine who left uh, at that time feeling so demotivated, so despondent, you know, kind of really hopeless. And so the organisation I'm involved with, the ULEX project, and the, the precursor to that, we started running a training we, we called then Sustaining Resistance. And we started using a very kind of participatory approach. It's like, well, how do we sustain ourselves? I mean, that, that's a question that each one of us has very, very different answers to. Right? There's no simple answer to that. Um, but over a number of years, through a sort of, you know, a sort of very participatory approach, supporting activists into spaces of reflection on their experience, gradually we started to build a bit of a methodology around that that kind of takes a very holistic approach you know it, it definitely points to the need and the importance for us to attend to the kind of intrapersonal the kind of inner work you know self-awareness emotional literacy these kinds of things and develop develop practices that that help us to to deepen these qualities in ourselves 
But at the same time, you know, it also gave an awful lot of attention to but what's going on in our interactions with others, the kind of interpersonal sort of dimension. You know, what's what's the culture in our organization like? How do we deal with conflict when it arises? How do we understand and work in a healthy way with the power dynamics that inevitably sort of you know come into all human interactions? And as well as the intrapersonal and the interpersonal. Of course, more and more we were kind of giving attention to and what's happening between organizations. What's the what's the what's the context that we're working in, the broader socio-political context? And so we've sort of developed a methodology, you know, to support activist resilience that sort of tries to kind of work in all these three spheres, the intrapersonal, the interpersonal, and you know, what's happening with our movements. How do we build the transformative power that's needed? so that we don't have to just be resilient right in a way that's like dealing with the stresses <laughs> that we put under but how do we change the social relations how do we change the social political context so that those stresses are not things we have to be enduring you know the resilience in that sense isn't just about being sort of you know enduring sort of standing up to the challenges it's not just about adapting you know, to, to changing circumstances, but it's also about building the transformative collective power that we need to really change those underlying structural conditions as well. So, you know, that's what we do. You know, we run we run a whole program at the ULEX project of training that kind of grew out of that interest in psychosocial resilience that look at, you know, the personal, the interpersonal and sort of movement level stuff. So, yeah, that's... That's what we're about. And, and it's so, you know, it actually when we were doing this, you know, starting to do this in 2009, 2010, um, there just wasn't that much attention to these kinds of things. You know, a lot of activists felt, uh, I think, a little bit, it was almost as though to give attention to these things was escapist or, or merely privileged or something, you know. And um, rather than recognising actually attending to resilience is a political uh, necessity. You know, these are long haul struggles that we're involved in. And unless we attend to the resilience of ourselves and our organizations, we're just not around long enough to build the kind of collective power that all of us on this call, I imagine, know that we we, we need to, to create to achieve the structural shifts that we're looking at. Yeah. Thanks, uh, G. Yeah, I think you're, you're touching there on, on something um, on something important of like, I guess, like we we see that those those things have evolved and those questions have been bubbling up in the climate movement. Those questions of emotional resiliency, of um, dealing with burnout, and all of these things, they've been coming up more and more. Uh, I guess in the, in the past few years, um, and I'm interested in in your perspective, G, as someone who's I guess like seeing a lot of those activists coming through. Uh, the trainings at ULEX, like what do you, what have you seen as like, what what have you seen evolved? What are the tendencies that you've seen uh, evolve in the last uh, few years? And and hope on your end, I guess, having this very, this, like, like as you said, you're a feminist as well. Um, and I guess I'm interested to, to get your sense of whether you're seeing a lot of differences between how the climate movement deals with those questions and how the feminist movement has historically, um, and and whether there's any lessons that we can draw from that. Uh, so yeah, interested in both of your perspectives on this. Do you want to go first, Hope, with that? I hope can uh, you still hear us. Okay, maybe G go first, and I'll try to see whether Hope is still with us. Yeah, no, sure. So, so uh, yeah, I guess it. Ah, here we go. Great. I'll I'll mute. Yeah, we can hear you, Hope, but I think okay, it might be better sure. without the video, so that we can hear you a bit more clearly. So we've realized that there is power in movement building. Because looking at the women's rights sector broadly, I think it is fair to say that you know you cannot carry all the bags that have been created by patriarchy 
that have been created by class, that have been created by homophobia, that have been created by you know, uh, uh, capitalism, that have been created by religious fundamentalism. So because of that, we need a very, very strong movement you know, to work with us, to carry the burden, because well-being is not individual, it's, it's collective. So if we think about the collective, it means that we look at the bags, B-A-G-S, the bags that we are carrying, and we identify those that we can drop, but those that need the power of the movement. And as we look at what needs the power of the movement, we identify you know, areas where we need to move together. Because really, you know, if you support uh, a, a woman or women and you support their well-being, it impacts on you. It impacts on the movement. It impacts on everyone, whether it is about climate change, whether it's about violence that comes from that supporting climate change, whatever it is, you need the power of the movement. And that means that we need to build movements that are strong enough to identify the bugs that we carry within that movement and see how we can drop them. And that means that we have to be very clear about strategy. We've got to be very clear about power, you know, both visible and invisible, the, the invisible power of culture, the invisible power of religion, the invisible power that various, you know, uh, religious institutions carry. We've also got to be very clear about power over, the power of organizations, the power of institutions, the power that we see, you know, in terms of the police, the, 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 the army, when they stop us from demonstrating, we have to be very clear about that power that we don't see. We may not see it's invisible. So moving as where we are going, moving as, you know, moving as a movement that have, has got a strategy uh, and a vision means that we know which bugs we need to drop. And we know that one person cannot drop those bugs. We need many people to drop those bugs. And if we are going to drop those bugs, we have to be well, because when we are not well, we cannot drop them. So being well means that we've taken the time to make ourselves well. It means that we've taken the time to ensure that we understand what individual and collective wellness mean. It means that we understand what, you know, uh, ensuring that the movement, the community that we work with is well. And what does wellness mean? It means that we have to go back to the wellness of the vehicle, our bodies. So if our bodies are well, if we ensure that we keep them you know, serviced and we understand what that service means, then we are moving towards wellness. I, I should add that you know uh, our bodies are vehicles. <laughs> They enable us to move from point A to point B. And vehicles are serviced. So if we don't service our bodies as our vehicles, then where are we headed? We need to keep our bodies in good repair. We need to keep our minds in good repair. We need to keep our emotions in good repair. We need to keep our um, uh, finances. <laughs> I know this is delicate. But we need to keep our finances in good repair. We need to keep everything that we are in good repair. And this is collective energy. Because without collective energy, we can't move this huge mountain of whatever is not going right, you know, uh, correct. So we need to bring our energies together and push this huge patriarchal mountain, huge capitalist mountain, huge homophobic mountain, huge, I don't know, whatever mountain you can think of forward, we need that energy. So what I'm advocating for 
is that the power of the collective that I think the, the previous you know, speaker talked about you know, as well. Thank you, Hope. Uh, G? Yeah, I guess um, you're asking about shifts and changes maybe, right, in, over, over the years uh, in approaching this stuff. I mean, for us, I think we used to struggle more in um, trying to support activists to try to honour a kind of a balance between action and reflection, you know. And I think there's more and more uh, understanding that for us to develop sufficiently responsive strategies and approaches, we do need to honour the need for deep reflection on experience, right? There's no, there's no simple, um, you know, off the shelf answer to the kind of, you know, to, to the, the, the really complex struggles with, you know, facing kind of interlocking systems of oppression. None of us have all the answers. And so building reflection in is so important. It used to be harder to do that. And I think more and more activists are aware that we need to develop this reflexive capacity. It doesn't mean it's easy, right? You know, there's like, of course, there's so much to be done and we're so, there's so many demands, there's such a lot of urgency. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do, but I think people are more willing to bear the tension between action and reflection to develop really transformative practices. So that's one thing, or willingness to bear attention rather than just push reflection out. You know, it's like we've just got to get on with it. So that's one thing. Another big change, I think, and you know, to some of this, I th to some extent, I think this relates to your question related to feminism is that we are seeing more and more willingness to incorporate like somatic awareness, you know, bringing some somat somatic uh, understanding uh, into activism. Um, much more attention to developing trauma-informed approaches because you know a trauma-informed approach is really essential if we're going to work look at well-being and sustaining ourselves so see much more of that um a greater willingness i think to talk in terms of cultivating cultures of care between us in our organizations uh, and step up to the incredible challenges involved in doing that, you know, the transformative uh, approach that's needed for that. And a lot of the, these, are, you know, these, these really are kind of very much sort of, you know, feminist type narratives, right, that are being, being sort of brought in. And a sense as well of the importance of really trying to embody our values in the way that we do activism, really trying to ensure that the kinds of social relationships within our organizations and within our groups are modeling the kind of world that we're trying to bring about. Yeah, so it's like we're, we're, we're taking more seriously the importance of that kind of prefigurative kind of approach, I think. So I think all of that for me, yeah, seems very, very positive. These are all very, very positive moves. Right? Hmm. Thank you, G. I want to uh, maybe um, direct ourselves towards something that you've uh, touched on, Hope, of how, I guess, the need for that care to be collective. Um, and I guess this is something that it feels like in some parts of our movement, the response to the kind of um, widespread burnout that we've been seeing has been very individualistic, has been to um, tell people to get more rest, to maybe meditate, to do all these very individual self-care things. Um, and um, not to say that these things aren't important, they are, but no. I guess they are not really at the level of what is needed to address the kind of crisis no. of care that we are feeling in our movements. So I wanna ask mm -hmm. you both, um, what does radical collective care look like to you and how do we get there without without dismissing the need for individual care as well but how do we get to that more collective care that is needed in our movement um, so care is both collective and it's individual as an individual you have to be you know careful and take care of your being but you also know as I've said before, that there are bugs that you cannot carry alone. You need the power of the collective. So one of the things that we need to really underline 
is the importance of movement building around self well being, collective well being. When one person gets affected by violence, we all get affected. When a person is harassed because of who they are, a person gets affected because she's a woman expressing herself, the whole movement gets affected. But much more is that when we are not well, we fragment the movement. We say things that we shouldn't say. We do things that we shouldn't do. We start chewing one another within the movement. So how do we build a movement that cares for everyone and cares for its self growth? That is the question. We need to find ways of building a movement that cares for individuals, but also cares for the collective. And I think up to now, we have, been in a, we have been in a situation where we concentrated on the individual, individual without understanding that when that individual is affected, you know, the whole movement is affected. When an individual is unhappy, we all get unhappy and we start chewing one another. A long time ago, I wrote an article about sisterhood within the women's movement and how when we fight within that movement, everyone gets affected. So the most important thing is to understand that well-being is a tool, it's a feminist tool that we should you know, advocate in that movement. It's a tool that we should appreciate. It's a tool that is very, very important in making shifts, power shifts within the movement. So what I'm saying to you is that um, well-being is collective. It's individual, but it's also collective because we carry bags that we did at pack, and they are huge. And if they are huge, they need a mass, you know, a mass of people that can carry it. And we can only do that through our movement building. Uh, and movement building has got its own, you know, tactics. How do we build movement? <laughs> Please don't ask. <laughs> How do we build movement? I think there are tactics for building movements, and we can learn from movements that have been there before you know, whether it is liberation movements or religious movements, but we can learn from those movements. But we've also achieved a lot through the women's movement, the feminist movement, and we need to appreciate how did that happen? What strategies were used? Who was involved? Who was at the center? So we need to go back to the drawing board and that's how some of the movements that have been successful were built. And so let me stop there. Thank you, Hope. Yes, yeah, so, so, so for me, this question about the kind of, I guess, tensions between individual or like self-care and kind of collective care um, are a little bit illusory in a sense, right? I mean, I think um, you can't have, you cannot have healthy collectives unless the individuals in those collectives are healthy individuals, right? Who are bringing self-awareness and emotional literacy to their own experience. Um, but you also can't have healthy individuals without healthy collectives. Um, it's like, you know, to the extent that we get drawn into individualistic strategies for our well-being, we just reinforce the kind of preoccupation that leaves uh -huh. us as the people who are brittle, fragile, contracted. That isn't wellness, you know. It's like that self-preoccupation uh -huh. is in itself quite painful, I think. So I think we need to always sort of place the kind of these individual practices within an understanding yeah. of ourselves as fundamentally social beings. You know, as a sort of shift in yeah. understanding 
it means that the, the idea that we can take care of ourselves we kind of see through that as kind of a, a bit delusional fundamentally right and it's the delusion that's incredibly compounded uh, because of the impact of like you know the neoliberal assault on you know our communities on, on, on our sense of solidarity between each other but for me you know there, there isn't a tension between the two we have to understand the inseparability mm -hmm. of forming ourselves and transforming the world and transforming ourselves and transforming our social contexts um, with, within activist sort of groups and organisations, we put a lot of emphasis on the importance of balancing three things for sort of the, the health of these kind of groups, which is we need to attend to a task, we need to attend to process, we need to attend to relationships. And task usually is kind of an easy thing for activists to kind of give attention to. You know, we want to, we want to get stuff done, right? Um, process to some extent, activists will often give attention to process, you know, we kind of like, how do we make decisions and how do we organise and all this kind of stuff. Often what gets neglected is the quality of relationships that underpin that really. So, I, you know, I think, you know, putting a lot of emphasis on the relationship building, the building of trust and understanding, uh, a sense of a sense that we're in this together, our sense of alignment. I just think that's such an important area to give attention to the quality of relationships that underpin a good process and enable us to get the stuff done we want to get done here you know, to do the task. Thank you, G. Uh, yeah, thanks both. These are uh, very important and insightful perspectives on this, I guess, this balance and this connection between collective care and individual care. Um, I want to bring up a question that has been asked in the uh, Q&A section um, that I'm uh, really keen to hear your thoughts on as well. Um, ah, I've lost it. Uh, we had a question, uh, yes, around um, basically seeing it seems that there are quite significantly fewer men involved in the environmental movement and I guess we could say similarly to other movements compared to the number of women in those movements how how do we get more men on board especially young men um and I guess maybe before that do you do you agree to this analysis from the person who's posted this this question do you also do you feel like there are more men less men in the movement than women um and if so why and how do we remedy that mm. <laughs> I, I, I think that first of all the issue of well-being is seen as a soft issue that uh, you know doesn't mean the masculine doesn't meet the masculine criteria of what is important and we need to demystify that second uh climate change and whatever is happening is also seen as a soft issue that requires feminine power that requires women power and doesn't invite men to the, to the discussions. <laughs> so we, I think we need to so that they understand that this is their issue too. I, I think when we think about uh, development, there are those issues that are seen as feminine. You know, this is a women's issue because it's a soft issue. It's not, you know, it doesn't boost your, your, your masculinity, you know. And I think without uh, unpacking what masculinity means, without unpacking femininity, without unpacking feminism, without understanding power and how power operates, we will not go very far. So we need to start thinking about power and how power operates, whether it is power within, whether it's power with others, whether it is, it is invisible power, whether it is power over whatever kind of power we are talking about, we need to start talking about power. And I think when do we do that, uh, young men and old men will understand. But for now, you know, when we talk about climate change, we talk about change in general. It's seen as a soft power. And 
my colleague, it will be interesting to hear his perspective. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I kind of like go with the question, you know, it's like maybe maybe whoever's asking the question has the data on this. I mean, I don't think I did, you know, it kind of feels like maybe it's a little bit anecdotal or something. I mean, when I think about, you know, we, we do things with a lot of uh, climate justice organizations and networks and so on. I can't say that I would miss, I would share that view from my, own, from my experience. So that that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, I'm not sure that I kind of quite want to kind of give um, credibility to such a simple binary way of thinking about who's taking part in our in our movements anyway. Um, you know, more and more we're seeing people bringing awareness to the constructive nature of their gender identities. Um, I think it's refreshing, an important thing. I think it's um, clearly that you know this isn't to sort of negate. The real impactful kind of nature of like gender on our social relations, our, our, our experiences in any way. But I think uh, developing a, a, an understanding of the kind of the more fluid, non binary, uh, constructed nature of gender is, is a crucial part of the struggles that we're involved in, at least for me, it is, and many of the people I work with. So, yeah, I mean, I think asking the question in that very binary way kind of plays back into kind of ways of thinking about the world that personally. I'm wanting to, us to sort of evolve beyond a little bit, I guess, yeah, without denying the history and the real concrete kind of impact of, you know, patriarchal ways of understanding gender. So sidestepping the, the question in a way, right? But there you go. No, thank you, G. I think that's a really important perspective to bring here. Um, and I was hoping that among other things that would come up, I think it, it, is an, it is an interesting one, right? Of, I think I can see how that analysis can come up in, in our movements or in certain groups or in certain parts of our movements. Uh, but I think it's, it's an important one to question uh, and to question both in terms of um, whether that's actually the case, but also to question, I guess, this kind of uh, binary approach to, um, to gender and to and to our activism in that sense and and bringing that more intersectional perspective on it as well uh so thank you for that uh g and thank you hope as well um another question that came up in uh the q a um uh caroline hickman so this morning we had a we ran a session on uh sustaining activism in the long run as well uh, and Caroline Hickman was part of it. Uh, she's a psychotherapist doing a lot of work on um, climate anxiety and things like this. And she said that burnout comes from loss of meaning rather than from um, a burden or, or overwhelm. It's, it's when we lose the meaning of what we do that we burn out. Uh, and so the question is, without a spiritual foundation, how do we sustain meaning to combat burnout? Or is a spirit, spiritual foundation essential to this work? Did you want to start this time, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think you know questions uh, around meaning are really, are, are really you know crucial uh, when we're thinking about sustaining ourselves. Uh, I don't think it's, I wouldn't agree that that is the cause of burnout, right? I mean, the whole approach we take is that there are a whole a multiplicity of conditions and you can have a real strong sense of meaning, but if you're under, you know, living under certain kinds of repressive conditions, you know, subject to kind of certain forms of oppression on a daily basis, you're still going to get worn down, you're going to get worn out, depleted and all the rest of it, right? So meaning doesn't necessarily trump all the other conditions that are there as well. Um, but yeah, of course, looking at the way we understand, you know, our worldview and the way we understand what the self is, the way we understand our purpose and, and our sense of direction, a kind of a, a really crucial area of reflection, I think, for most activists, right? Um, and is it does it need a spiritual underpinning? It depends how you how you define the term, right? I mean, I think, um, yeah, I would say that 
in a, in a sort of superficial sense of the term spiritual. You know, I have a sort of spiritual foundation in my life. Uh, there's a bit of a risk, I think, of like, you know, spiritual as opposed to kind of material. You know, I think the kind of worldview I have kind of doesn't see a sort of a, a simple divide, a sort of dualistic kind of thing between the spiritual and material. For me, spiritual, I think, in that sense, connects to the sense of a connection with something bigger than ourselves. And that sense of something bigger than ourselves can be the solidarity you have with our movements, a sense of solidarity with life, um, which is, you know, potentially kind of a spiritual source, source of source of nourishment, right? So, so yeah, I think a spiritual connection in that sense is is really important. Yeah, and meaning, gosh, that's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, it's going to, you know, that changes through our lives, right? It's the sense of what is most meaningful to us. Um, and I, I, but I think deeper reflection on that, yeah, it's really, really important. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, um, analyzing our worldview. You know, what, how do we, how do we, how do we make sense of things? Uh, is an is an important thing to understand in terms of developing deeper self awareness. Yeah. Thank you, G. Um, Hope, do you want to share some thoughts as well on, on this question of um, of uh, spiritual foundation to sustain uh, meaning as a way to combat burnout? I do agree that spirituality has got different meanings for us. For me, uh, spiritual um, groundedness is connected to nature. When we understand nature and we are part of the, then we get grounded. Talk about spiritual grounding is connecting with the earth. Because without connecting with earth, without connecting with, with, with nature, where we get our nutrients, where we get our food, where we get our air where we get really, you know, where we, we, we get the, 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 the way of being, the, the, the life to be in this world, then we are lost. So I think in a way, spirituality is connected with this because when we are not well, it means we are ungrounded. And when we are ungrounded, it means our roots don't go deep. And if they are not deep, they don't sustain us. So there is something about spirituality and nature because how can we live in this world without connecting to that which sustains us? Our nutrients come from the ground. Our food comes from the ground. Our air comes from the ground. Whatever it is that makes us who we are comes from the ground. And for me, that's part of spirituality. But I'm very much aware that spirituality means different things to different people. But for me, the spirituality means connecting with the earth. It means connecting with everyone else. It means connecting with um, that which enables us to be. That's my understanding of spirituality. But as I've said, people have got different meanings of spirituality. And then when I think about spirituality, I connect it with feminism because you can't be a feminist without understanding climate change. It's difficult to be a feminist without understanding that which feeds your soul, S-O-U-L. You can't be a feminist, I think, without walking in this world very much aware that you are not alone you are, you are with creatures, you are with plants, you are with oceans, you are with water, you are with everything. So that's what spirituality means to me. And when we disconnect from that, which makes us who we are, we get lost. When we disconnect from that, which enables us to connect with one another, breath, we are disconnected from one another. And when we, we disconnect from that, which makes us human, we are disconnected from one another. So that's what spirituality means to me. And that's why I think that loss of spirituality can disconnect us from the world that we live in.
Thank you, Hope, and thank you, uh, G, as well, for your thoughts on this. Um, so I guess like going a, a bit um, away from the wider discussion, I was wondering, uh, G, if you would be uh, willing to share maybe some of the practices or tools that are being used, um, I guess, by you and, and ULEX and provided to uh, activists in the movements to uh, around those questions of uh, resiliency and, and sustaining activism. If you can talk to us a bit more about, about that kind of work that you're doing. Yes, yeah, so so uh, in the schedule for this call, I think there was the idea we'd take a, a chunk of time to do this, right? So that's now, is that they can do that? Okay. So maybe I'll take 10, 15 minutes to kind of share, share a couple of things. All right. So I'm going to, I'll share a screen, okay, uh, first of all. And so let me see what have we got here. Um, right. Mm -hmm. We'll get there right, eventually. Yeah, let's see if this works. So, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit of background here, right? Um, you can see my screen now, I'm guessing, right? So, so yeah, I mean. As I said, we started doing this work kind of back in back in 2009, 2010, running this training, Sustaining Resistance and Parallel Renewal. And really at the heart of that is this, this kind of action learning kind of approach. So in, ter as, in terms of sharing practices, uh, I think that this is a really crucial tool and practice for anybody wanting to develop a really sustainable approach um, to, to, to their activism, right? Which is building into their practice this kind of action learning cycle, right? So rather than just doing stuff, having experience and habitually kind of repeating things until we wear ourselves down, going from action to experience, but then building in sort of deeper reflection uh, so that we can sort of, you know, learn from experience, transform the way we do things and develop a really, um, really responsive kind of practice that evolves over time. Right, so action learning is kind of really important. And in the educational work we do, you know, we use these kind of these, these methodologies, right, to support that, that, that ongoing learning. We need, I think we also, you know, need to be taking a really um, kind of holistic approach to that, right? So our work, I think, as activists has to, has to address the thinking, the rational side of ourselves, but it has to address the feeling, the emotional side, the sensing, the somatic side, and also kind of like on a, something which is a bit more, almost the sort of the intuitive sort of aspect of our experience as well, right? So to do that, we, we take this kind of regenerative approach to activism. You know, we, 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 we assume that most of us are working under conditions where the social matrix out of which our activism grows is really depleted. So sustaining it isn't enough. Right? If we think about agriculture, sustainable agriculture is fine if you've already got kind of a rich kind of biodiversity, if you have soil that is like full of nutrition, but because of kind of extractive practices, soil gets depleted, it gets worn out, you know, deforestation, uh, destruction of biodiversity, uh, soil erosion, et cetera, et cetera. So a sustainable approach isn't enough. We need to think regeneratively about our activist practice. How does our activism actually rebuild vitality and sources of energy? And so the work we do at ULEX is about that, you know, we, we, in the same way that regenerative agriculture tries to return vitality into the soil, our approach is about how do we return that vitality into the, the social fabric of our kind of, of, of our movements, right? So we use a capacities framework to think about that. And I think this is important in, in terms of um, us, us thinking about well-being practices. It's like on the right hand side of the screen there, you can see the capacities framework we use. You know, we, we, we run a program assuming that movements need all of these capabilities, like a narrative capacity, you know, coming back to this question of meaning, it's like being able to tell the story of who we are, how we got here, where we're going. This is really important. A movement to the disruptive capacity, open up space for change. 
within institutional capacity, you know, to translate the power of narrative and disruption into structural change. But we also need these other two, like the prefigurative, which we spoke a bit about earlier on, like how do we walk the talk? How do we embody values within our groups? And we also need the capacity for resilience, right? which this session is very much about. But placing resilience not as an added extra, but as a fundamental movement capability. Right? And I think that that in itself is an important practice that we continue to place an emphasis on that as part of our kind of core movement work. Doing the other things without building resilience in isn't going to give us the longevity that our movements really need. So, you know, as a practice, thinking about resilience as a, as a, as a core capability, right? We think about resilience as a core capability. Again, it's like it's not enough to just think about that at the individual level. We have to think about it at an organizational group level and at a social movement uh, level as well. Um, when we look at the impact of the kind of stresses that wear people down, we see the symptoms showing up in the individual, um, you know, just with sort of basic burnout. We see them showing up in the group, uh, the way that we, you know, we, we sort of relationships break down, trust break down, et cetera, et cetera. And we see them in our movements. You know, we see the way that um, organizations enter into like inter-organizational conflict. We see fragmentation. So our strategies for psychosocial resilience need to have practices at all three levels. Right? So you're asking, what are the practices? Well, there's an incredible range of practice that we need to use in a really holistic way. And I think we have to understand resilience as not just um, weathering difficulty, right? So we, we use this kind of three, we think about three aspects of psychosocial resilience is all very important. There is the absorptive capacity, right? The ability to mitigate, you know, negative offense to cope with stresses. There is an adaptive capacity, right? The ability to, um, you know, transform our practice over time, you know, to, to, to build our capacity to adapt and respond to changing circumstances. But the third part is so crucial, right? Resilience has to also include this transformative capacity where we're changing the conditions under which we're working, social conditions, the institutional conditions, the cultural conditions, um, so that we're not just having to absorb and adapt to stress, but we're changing the underlying structures, right? So, you know, this is this comes back to this need to work at the individual group and social movement level to really build resilience. So we just recently produced this, right? And I'll, I'll, I shared it in in the chat. Hopefully, you've had a chance to open it, right? So it's a it's a handbook that looks at that whole range of practices. Right? Um, the way the the manual is is structured is that it has a whole set of chapters that look at the intrapersonal, the interpersonal, and the socio-political, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna open that manual, I think now, I'm gonna share the screen and show you inside it a little bit. So let me just see, let's try and find out. I might reshare my screen, right? So I can make sure I'm showing you the right screen now. Let's see this one here, yeah, let's try this. Right, so this is the manual, right? So practices, right? This is a sustaining climate justice movement, a training manual, and it's full of uh, activities, learning activities that some of these are things that people will take on as trainers, you know, run with groups, but a lot of it is kind of really good peer to peer stuff. These are activities and practices and sessions that you can run with your colleagues, right, without being yeah, especially kind of a, a, a special kind of you know, having special training skills or something, right? So inside it, you can see there's a whole bunch of chapters, right? So there are there are some that talk about the background to psychosocial resilience. There's a chapter about how to use the thing, but then going into those different areas, the inter interpersonal, interpersonal, and the social movement level, you've got all these chapters. So burnout as a general theme, the in, the intrapersonal aspect of practices with developing self-awareness, emotional literacy, working with overwhelm, working with pain, working with difficult emotion, stuff about body work. But then you move on to the stuff that's more about the interpersonal, the interpersonal you know, uh, groups and organizational cultures. How do we build sustainable cultures, resilient and regenerative cultures? How do we ensure that our ways of organizing uh, embody active solidarity, equity, empowerment, inclusion, 
how do we bring trauma-informed approaches, and so on. So, you know, you can see there's a whole bunch of different kind of things here. If you go into each of those chapters, I'll just show you show you one as a, as a kind of little example and show you the kind of practices and tools that are in there. So you get this one on burnout. It gives a sort of an overview. Uh, it gives a kind of a, you know, how do we think about burnout? Well, it's not just getting worn out. It's not just depletion, as well as depletion of energy, there's also this kind of sense of contraction, the hardening that happens, you know, in burnout, the kind of cynicism, the narrow mindedness, the loss of creativity and flexibility in the ways we think. And the third part of that is this disconnection. You know, we get disconnected from each other, we withdraw. Uh, we get disconnected from our own experience, disconnected from our bodies, the sort of alienation, this kind of thing. So, you know, it talks about well, what is burnout in the sort of, you know, in, in, in the broadest sense. And then, you know, stuff about identifying burnout, et cetera, et cetera. But then at the end of each chapter, right, what you're going to find is a whole set of activities, right? Resources, further reading. Um, and in there, I just we open one of these. So here's a little practice that you know you can download this thing and, and sort of do this in a group. Here's one which is called the Burnout World Group Activity, right? So this is a reflective practice. You do it with a group of people. All of these different activities look like this. They'll tell you how long they take to run, the kind of format they have, materials you need, that kind of stuff. And then there's a whole framing kind of text, you know, what, what's the purpose, what are the aims of this kind of activity. And in this one in particular, what we're kind of doing is you're supporting people to use this burnout wheel tool, right? So, you know, in a participatory session, you kind of brainstorm into these different areas as a group. What are the general kind of conditions that lead to burnout, that lead to a lack of sustainability? What are our personal behavioral tendencies? What are the underlying emotional and psychological uh, needs? What kind of views and beliefs do we bring that undermine our, our sustainability? What are the dynamics in our groups that wear us down and deplete us? Um, you know, you have to attend to material needs as well. And again, thinking about the wider social and structural factors. So an activity like that, you know, in a group is a really important way as a practice, right, to understand what are the conditions that are leading to us getting burnt out. Uh, this gives you a framework to have those conversations with each other, to build a shared understanding of those kind of things. And then you can sort of take a, 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 an activity like this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just talk to you for a minute. Yeah, you can kind of, you know, you can stop. You can, you can take an activity like that, which is building a shared general understanding of the multiplicity of conditions that wear us down. And then you can start asking, but in the concrete um, experience we have at the moment, which are the most important? Where are the places that we can make interventions that would change the conditions that deplete us and wear us down and help us to become more sustainable, more resilient in, in, in our practice? And that might be, you know, about self-awareness, might be important for you, your, your colleagues. It might be that you need to kind of have the tools for exposing this really toxic kind of, you know, unspoken conflict or tension that's in the group. It might be that you need to think about how do we build better alliances with some of the people that we're trying to kind of, you know, strengthen our movement with. But you need to do the reflection, analyze the conditions, and then find the right kind of tools, right, to the right practices that are going to be most effective in your specific situation. Because you know, we're all we're all living different lives. We're all, we're all doing our activism under different kinds of conditions. So, you know, reflection, analysis, and then you know, and that manual has got a whole load of different tools and practices that would be useful across that range of intrapersonal, interpersonal, and you know, movement ecology kind of practice. Yeah. So anyway, I shared it with you. So do have a look at it, use it, share it with anyone you like. It's it's just kind of out there. Right? It's a PDF. Yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, G. It is, I think, more than helpful. It, it feels like such a precious and important resource to be able to have this in our movements. On, on this, there, there are a few people who've been asking whether this um, guide or tool is available in other languages or just in English for now. Uh, we we were very lucky to uh, have some people offer to translate it into Portuguese. So we have a lot of the a lot of the uh, framing text in Portuguese. They're not published in a PDF yet. We need to kind of load that into a, into a, into a design. 
we do have a version of it, um, which is a sort of a, a migrant solidarity version that I think has a, a Spanish, uh, Italian and Greek uh, translations. Yeah, it's a slightly different version, which should develop more for people doing migrant solidarity work rather than climate justice specific. Yeah. So you 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 can you you can find those through the website. I think. Amazing. Thank you so much, G. And yeah, just such such a precious resource to to have in our movement. So thank you. Uh, to you and I guess to everyone else who's been working on it. It feels really important. Um, Hope, I think we had discussed that you wanted to maybe share a, a practice as well around, around care and resiliency. Yes. Uh, my own analogy is that of a tree. And it also comes from, you know, what we all know, we know trees. It's not really sophisticated. It's very simple, but I think it works. So if you have a notebook, you have a pen, draw a tree starting with the roots. So when you think about the roots, how deep are your roots? How grounded are you? And what practices do you use to ground you? Whether it's you as an individual or your organization. What roots you, what grounds you? What is it that enables you to survive? What is it that enables you to ensure that you get nutrients from whatever you believe in? And this is something that we can do, you know, as a group, it's something we can do as individuals. Groundedness, it's about groundedness. What grounds you? What roots you? What enables you as an organization? What enables you as an individual to really be grounded so that when you are far away from yourself, you can get back to self. Because we talk about being beside ourselves. Sometimes we say, I was beside myself with fear. I was beside myself with worry. How do you get back to self? What is it that grounds you? So if you've grown a tree, if you've drawn a tree, think about the trunk. The trunk represents your support system. Where does it come from? And if you have support system, acknowledge it. Do you even know it? Do you acknowledge it? Do you keep it going? That trunk represents your support system. Whether you're an individual, an organization, how do you get your support system? We got the leaves, the sources of knowledge and skills. Where do you get your sources of knowledge from? I usually say that um, civil society organizations can discourage de you because you're always working, you are busy. It might be difficult to read, to watch movies, to meet people that you're interested in, to go to seminars, to go to workshops, to connect with different sources of knowledge. So where, where is your source of knowledge as an individual and as an organization. How do you ensure that you are current? How do you ensure that you are creative? How do you ensure that, you know, you, you remain, you know, in, and you don't deteriorate, you don't expire, <laughs> and you remain connected to the world. That is the Trump. I want to go to the leaves. The leaves are, you know, you no, know, the trump is your support. The trump, the, the leaves are your sources of knowledge and skills. And I think I've talked about that. But the trump is where you get your support. So let me start. Groundedness is about that which grounds you. It might be your values, it might be your mission, it might be whatever it is. What is it that grounds you? Then we got the trump. 
the trump is your support and the leaves are your sources of knowledge so let's go to the um uh, uh flowers flowers represent your hopes and dreams in many organizations we've stopped you know, stopping, just stopping to dream, just stopping to think about our values, just stopping, think about what makes us who we are. So that happens at organizational level. It also happens at individual level. Everything starts with imagination. So if we've stopped imagining, if we can't stop and dream, if we can't Stop aside time to just reflect and we got the fruits. The fruits represent gratitude. Because whether you're an organization or an individual, there are things you are grateful for. In my own life, I have a jar where at the end of the day, I put the things I'm grateful for. Within my organization, we've got a jar where you know every day we put things we are grateful for, and end of the week we review that. And then, if you have a tree, there are leaves that can no longer serve you; they are dead. What is it that you want to let go of? So this is really simple. You have the image of a tree, or the analogy of a tree, and you are thinking about the roots. What roots you? Have you neglected that which roots you? Are you paying attention to that which roots you? Are you paying attention to that which roots the organization? Do you still remember the vision and the mission of the organization? Do you still remember the values of the organization? Then we got the trunk and this is your support system. Every organization needs to have a support system. As an individual, your support system. But as activists, sometimes we forget our support system. We are very busy, we don't attend weddings, we don't attend baptisms, we don't attend social gatherings, we don't attend anything because we are busy. And then when we need that support system, it's not available. And we say, you are not available for me, but were you available for them? Organizations too need that support system. Who is in your support system? It might be consultants, it might be funders, it might be friends, it might be stakeholders. Who is in your strike system? And then we got the leaves. This is your knowledge. Do you take time? to really, 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 you know, progress because your knowledge is enabling you to progress. Are you busy working, working, working that you forget that you need to ensure that your knowledge is upgraded? You forget that you need to talk to people, you need to read, reading, you need to write. You need to see movies that you know are in your area of expertise. You need to listen to stories. Where is your knowledge coming from? But also, how are you contributing to existing knowledge and skills? Then we go to the, to, to the fruits. And these are your hopes and dreams. Do you take time to reflect? Do you take time to just stop and you know, like spend a week reflecting, cross doors, cross windows, cross everything and reflect and say, what is our organization about? What strategies are working? What strategies are not working? Who is unhappy? What are they struggling with? Just to get in touch with one another. And then we got fruits. Gratitude is very important. In my own life, you know, every day, at the end of the day, I think about things that I'm grateful for. 
But I also think that organizations, we should think about things we are grateful, the, the stakeholders that we reach out to and their you know, input into our work. Those might be the things we are grateful for. And then we have to think about the leaves that we need to let go of. <laughs> Those ones that no longer serve you as you move into the future. We don't just let go of them, but they turn into manure. And as they turn into manure, they also you know, enrich us. But there are things we have to let go of, and we learn from those things that we let go of. So this is my well-being tree that I'm presenting to you. And you can use it for meditation. You can use it for journaling. You can use it in your own organization. Imagine when you sit and you think about that which grounds you. And then at say, is it still grounding you? Your values are important. You. Your plan is important. Is it ground individual? What grounds you? Imagine if you sit as an, as, you know, as an organization and you think about your sources of support, where does it come from? Imagine if you sit and think about your sources of knowledge, where does it come from? Are you stuck? Are you stagnant? Are you progressing? Is the knowledge within the organization greater than the knowledge outside there? Because people expect that. And then you think about what you are grateful for and so on and so forth. So this is the well-being tree that I'm presenting to meditation. You use it for journaling. You use, you use it in your own organization to really reflect on your practices. And you can also use it within the community, the stakeholders that you work with. So that is my message to you. <laughs> the world be true. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. Uh, that is a very beautiful tool to share with us. Um, I feel like we both, we, with both of you, we're all going to leave this call much more equipped uh, to be resilient. Uh, so th thank you both for sharing those practices and tools um, that we can use in our daily lives. Um, I guess as we're slowly drawing to the end of this call, I want I think maybe the, the kind of last question that I want to ask you a bit as like closing remarks is picking up from uh, Hope's mention of uh, the importance to hold on to our hopes and dreams. I guess I want to know what what are your hopes and dreams, both of you, uh, and maybe what gives you hope? I feel, I feel like both as people who are quite, um, who are obviously activists, but also quite like in in touch and faced with this, with this question of care and and the, maybe this this kind of um, yeah question of how we care for ourselves and others. Um, I'd be interested to know both what what gives you hope uh, and what you're hopeful for. <laughs> Do you want to start, Hope? Yes. Uh, I'll start. I look at the work that we have done, especially within the feminist movement. Wait, not for the feminist movement, it would be difficult for us to break doors and go inside the house and look at issues of sex and sexuality, look at how issues of well being are being practiced at individual level and household level. It would be difficult for us to go within organizations and talk about well being. It would be difficult for us to go with, with these communities and talk about well-being and say, this is the work, really, it's not by the way. So what gives me hope is that we are having this discussion. What gives me hope 
is that we understand that well-being is collective. What gives me hope is that without being well, you know, the way we are understanding now, we can't have sustainable movement. What gives me hope is that the world outside there is determined to make sure that we die sad, but we are also determined to make sure that we die happy. And you know, uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, the world is determined to make us very, very, very sad by denying us our rights, by you know, reassuring that the the context within which we work is very different. But we are also determined that we keep getting together to make sure that you no, know, we are going to ensure that we do this work not as fragmented human beings, but as human beings who work together and ensure that we understand the power of the collective and ensure that we understand our own power within and ensure that we understand the power to, the power, you know, to make sure that things happen and ensure that we understand that we, 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 we are moving together, you know, the collective power. And that is the power of the movement. And we've been promoting movements. The other thing that gives me you know, hope is the power of feminism. Ensuring that, you know, uh, that which is hidden is made visible. And usually what is hidden is that invisible power, the power of culture, the power of religion, the power of institution. We are putting institutions, we are putting it out there and saying that no. We are not going to be held back by that kind of power. And what gives me hope are these conversations that we have, that we understand that well-being, without being well, we remain fragmented. Without being well, we walk beside ourselves. We are not together. Without being well, we are not who we are meant to be. We can't have the power that you know, that we need. So in a nutshell, the power of ensuring that, you know, resilience is collective. Resilience is not about withstanding pain. It's about ensuring we have the tools that deal with that pain. Resilience is about ensuring that we all understand where we are going as you know, hand, and ensuring that resilience is about well-being. Because when we are not well, we cannot perform. That gives me hope. Mm. It's a tricky question to end on, isn't it? I think, for me at least. I mean. I kind of, you know, watching the watching the the kind of cycles uh, that people go through of kind of hope and hopelessness, you know, a sense of yes we can, and then a sort of sense of failure, uh, a sense of like we won, but then a sense that our victories are so compromised and partial, right? This kind of rising and falling of that sense of motivation. Because like I've found myself for quite a few years looking for a kind of motivation that I think rides somewhere between hope and hopelessness. You know, it's like it's almost like beyond those cycles of hope and hopelessness. Uh, I kind of see, I think, and a, a lot of this is about connotation, right? The way we kind of understand certain words. But for me, hope often has quite a strong future orientation about it. Um, and certainly I live my life with a sense of direction, you know, a sense of purpose, a sense of the kind of changes that could be. But what nourishes my motivation isn't the hope that that will happen, but the joy and the delight of acknowledging what we're doing together now. You know, a sense of um, the delight in being in a space with this number of people who really care, okay? who are kind of looking to act in solidarity with each other. So I think it's, you know, it's the hope, it's more of a sense of kind of the, yeah, the, the delight and the joy of what we are doing together of, honouring each other's integrity, each other's kind of the choices that, that we're each making in the present today, yeah, which helps me to sort of find this line beyond, beyond hope and hopelessness.
Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's certainly interesting. I, I feel like um, as an activist, I often find it a very interesting question to ask other activists, not necessarily what gives them hope, but also just what is hope to them. I feel like we all have very, maybe slightly different understandings of what hope is to us. Um, mm -hmm. And so that means that we get hope in different ways and from different things. And um, yeah, I find it really interesting. I, I have a um, a really close friend of mine who once told who once told me that he didn't have any hope and I said but what how you how you've been organizing for so long how do you sustain your activism and your organizing if you don't have any hope and he said well I don't need the hope because I just need to know that what I'm fighting for is is just and is important and I don't need to feel hopeful that we'll get there um which still I'm still it still feels a, a quite <laughs> harsh uh, view on things um maybe a bit cynical but found it really interesting because I I couldn't imagine doing what we do without having any hope um so yeah thank you both uh for bringing your own perspectives of hope and sharing what gives you hope and what you're hopeful for um we have a, a few minutes left I don't know if there was any any other thing that you wanted to share here that you didn't get the the chance maybe that didn't came up in the questions any closing thoughts or remarks uh, that either of you or both of you wanted to share before we wrap up this space mm. just maybe i would just want to say oh, go, go for it no no go. <laughs> maybe what i really want to share is looking at what we have achieved as a movement, whether it is a movement of climate change, whether it is feminist movement, whether it is the LGBTIQ movement, I think the power of the collective gives me hope. I know that, you know, um, we still have a long way to go. I know that sometimes we, are, we forget our achievements. I know that we work in contexts, contexts that are very difficult. But at the end of the day, really when I sit and take stock of what we have achieved, I feel proud. And I don't think that would have helped, that would have happened without the power of the collective. So I still, you know, think that we need to build very strong movements. I still think that we need to make our voices loud and clear. I still think that we need to cultivate a sense of well-being to flourish. I still think that we need to enhance, you know, the way we work within our organizations. But at the end of the day, I look at our achievements and I'm proud. From the feminist perspective, would it be where we are without working together? And would it be where we are without having hope that keeps us going? So I'll stop there. Yeah, no, I mean, it's been quite a long session already on Zoom, hasn't it? And there's something in the in the, in the the chat already, right, about all the, the Q&A about, you know, how how hard it is to sustain ourselves with so much screen time. So I was just going to keep it very short. And the only thing I would add was just to say thank you and, you know, just massive appreciation for all the work the team are doing in, in putting this together. And, yeah, and to Hope as well for taking the time to be with us also. So, yeah, just thank you very, very much. Yeah. Lots of appreciation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much both. And uh, yeah, apologies for those uh, those of you who, who didn't get your question asked to panelists. It's always a bit of a tricky one to try and, and bring some questions and knowing that we won't be able to necessarily cover all of the questions. Um, but it was a really inspiring space to, to be here with both of UG and Hope. So thank you so much for making the time for that. Um, I want to mention for uh, participants that you will get 
the recording and the resources from this uh, sent to you in the next week. So don't worry about that. Um, and I want to also uh, really, really thank um, Chris and Katie and they who helped with tech today and all of our interpreters. I know it was a difficult one with uh, with internet connections and uh, mics and things and really, really appreciating your presence uh, and your work today. It, it is such an important thing to be able to make all those spaces and discussions more accessible by offering interpretation. Uh, and I'm aware it wasn't the easiest one today. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, again, one more time, G and Hope, thank you so, so much for all of your wisdom and reflections and thoughts. It was uh, really humbling to, to be part of this discussion with both of you. So thank you. And uh, wherever you all are in the world, I hope you have a great rest of your day um, and maybe a restful, gentle and slow one. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.